Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Virtual Physique. Thank you for stopping by. It's been a little while since I've done an informational video. I mean a really good informational video. So welcome. This may be one of the biggest and most helpful informational videos I have ever made. Guys, welcome to Welcome to the Vitruvian model of genetics. So this is a video that I've wanted to make for a long time. I spent the last month or two just thinking about how I'm gonna do it, how I wanna approach this. I think I, I finally figured it out. And of course, it's a formula. People don't really understand how important genetics are when it comes to their physical development goals. And I think a really good way of illustrating that is you got multiple factors to how you can build your best body. But that's the three big ones in my opinion, obviously training, nutrition, and to some extent sleep. You can, this can go on forever. You can get into other things like hydration, uh, stress level, schedule, uh, supplementation. I mean, it goes on forever. But I think these three, especially these two, they are very big and very important. However, there is one additional factor, and I'm not going to include it on this list because it's not an individual factor. It's something which is like, it, it's like an umbrella term, and it encompasses everything, and that is genetics. This is extremely important because genetics are going to be the difference between someone who works unfortunately really hard and gets like 50% results or someone who puts in half the work and they get like 100% results. I mean, it sucks, but let's be honest guys, the world isn't all puppies and sunshine and rainbows and everybody gets gumdrops and lollipops and a billion dollars. No, there are people out there who are going to do half the work and get twice the results. It's the same in this as it is in essentially everything else. But that's okay. Once we, you know, we, we dry our tears and stop whining and being like, oh, we're all beautiful, hardworking snowflakes. Once we can get past that, we can accept this and move forward and continue to improve our physiques to the best that they can be within our genetic blueprint. Now, although I say that, like there's good and bad, it's not really a binary. Nothing in life really is. It's a spectrum. You've got people with, unfortunately, not that great genetics, and you've got people with good genetics. We all know these people. We hate these people because they just, you know, it's like they go into the gym, they pick up a weight twice, and suddenly their arms are twice the size of you, and they're lifting three times more than you, and they're putting on muscle, but they're not getting fat, and everything just seems to be awesome for them, and, you know, the world just clicks. Fuck you guys. But the rest of us, most of us, are probably going to be somewhere along this spectrum. You know, we've got people here, we got people here who are like, you know, I'll a lot of people are going to be here in this medium range and you got people who are a little bit more you know benefited but this is very important for two reasons number one i think a lot of people out there and i'm almost I'm, i wish i could take this video and like send it back through time and send it to myself when i was like 18 19 20 and i was really first getting into lifting for the first time i actually started taking this seriously and i had certain physiques that i wanted to look like and it wasn't like, I just kind of want to look like them. No, no, I want to look like that. I want to be that big, that shredded. I want to have those shoulders, that waist, this, that. I want to have those kind of biceps. And invariably, I realized over time that with my genetic capability, where I am on the spectrum, if I'm around here somewhere, it's going to be very, it's a one-way ticket to feeling like crap when you compare yourself, especially in social media, to people who are closer to this side of the spectrum. So I think that this video is going to be very important because if you understand this and you're able to analyze your own genetics, you may realize that like, hey, if I'm somewhere here, probably not the best idea for me to compare to someone here. I can learn from these people. I can get motivated by these people, but I can't be like, why don't I look like this? There's a reason why. And the second reason is, this one might be a little bit more controversial, I'll be honest. And this is purely my opinion. So if you disagree with that, that's fine. It kind of sucks when I see people here and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Usually, you know, if you have a good body, you probably know a good amount about fitness, nutrition, all that stuff. But there are some people who just, they just coast through life on this. They just wake up, they got a six pack, they got like 19 inch arms, they're 200 pounds and like 8% body fat. And no matter what they do, they're, you know, they're pretty damn good. They put in like a third of the effort, they still look way better than you. And sometimes these people, they turn this into a career, they turn this into a business, and they start just spewing crap and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Now. Fortunately, I do think that is a minority. I think the majority of people who have good bodies, uh, good results, they, all, they probably got that way doing something right. So they have some good advice to offer. But there are some people out there, I guarantee, I have seen it, I guarantee it. There are people out there right now with like, they got like 17 packs and they're like 
10%, no, not even like 6% body fat. They look like fitness models 365 days of the year and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Shredded abs, bro, just do a lot of sit-ups. Creatine is a steroid. Bro, everybody needs to be doing detox teas. <laughs> but the problem is, Judging and estimating where you are on the spectrum is very difficult because there are just way too many variables to analyze and no matter what, it's gonna be extremely subjective. But fortunately for you guys, thanks to my channel's semi-creepy fascination with numbers, I have created kind of a way, at least in my opinion, to estimate this. There's no way to perfectly do this, but I think this will be kind of a fun way of doing so. Welcome to the Vitruvian model of genetics. I have broken it down, taken this thing, kind of digested it down to what, in my opinion, is a good way of looking at it. We got four different variables, and we are gonna be covering this over the next five videos. Guys, when I said this is gonna be a big informational video, it is so big that I had to break it up. But guys, to keep the suspense, I'm not gonna give away all the variables in this video. You're gonna to have to tune into the next ones because we're gonna leave things up to you know your imagination. We're gonna we're gonna keep things sexy. But that sounded creepy. That sounded really creepy. So let's keep things nice and simple. Today we're gonna to be focused on an F, and this represents muscle mass. Pure and simple. This doesn't look at body fat percentage. This doesn't look at your bone structure. This doesn't look at any of those things. We are simply talking about how much physical raw pounds of muscle you are able to put on. Essentially, let's say you take two individuals. You know, we got person A and person B, and they start off in a hypothetical situation with the exact same body. Literally, same body fat, same height, same strength, same everything. These guys are not trained or they have trained for the, the exact same amount of time. Everything about them is identical. And then you give them the exact same nutrition, the exact same training protocol, the exact same you know strict amount of sleep, and you make them do this for a year. And then they come back after, after 12 months, and one person, you know, person A has put on 20 pounds of lean body mass, lean muscle mass, and person B has put on 10 pounds. Well, you know, congratulations, both of them did a good job, but there is a clear discrepancy between these two individuals. Person A clearly has a greater ability to put on muscle mass and do so in a faster manner. So this is A, kind of unfair, and also it doesn't make sense. Assuming you do the exact same training program, you, do, you, know, you sleep the same, you eat the exact same way, shouldn't you have at least a somewhat similar response? Not necessarily, and let's take a look at a real life example. <laughs> There was a study done. This one was pretty interesting. They took a big sample size, uh, and meaning sample size. It was over 500, I think it was like 200 men or 300, it was a lot of people. They made them go the exact same 12 week training program. It essentially looked at bicep flexors, which is just a fancy way of saying, essentially they did um, bicep curls. Then, what they did is they looked at their overall muscle mass gain, and the way they did this is they pretty much analyzed their cross-sectional area of the bicep. So, Literally, like, like how, how big did your bicep, here's your starting bicep, here's your ending, what does the percentage change? How much bigger did you get? They also did the same thing for your one rep max, pretty much how much weight could you curl for like one rep now versus at the end of the 12 weeks. And they decided to, okay, let's see, if people do the exact same training program, we should see a similar, similar results. Not the case, not even close. So the results, they were pretty interesting. As you can tell, they show a very standard bell curve style distribution. The vast majority of individuals in this sample, in this in this study, are somewhere in the middle. And then as you kind of go towards either end, um, the low responders and the high responders, it gets less and less until we're dealing with pretty much like these like these anomalies. I mean, you had some guys who gained a freaky amount of mass, way more than everybody else. There's not many of them, but you know there are some. And there's some people out there who unfortunately gained very little. We're talking zero or potentially even lost bicep size, which is ridiculous considering, hey, you spent 12 weeks training and, yeah, sorry, you're actually smaller than you were before. So this is interesting. But the thing that I wanna point out about this, you know, let's not look at either ends of the spectrum, you know, the higher, the lower responders. Let's just look at the, the majority of the individuals, kind of this big, fat, meaty part, the majority of responders. These aren't anomalies by any means, yet there are still quite a bit of people who gain just about 5% to their bicep in terms of cross-sectional area, and there's also quite a bit of people who gained 30%. So, again, not anomalies. We're dealing with regular people, a good amount of them. There's a good amount of these individuals in either, either sections of the chart, and yet still, these people gain six times 
you know, uh, the improvement. Switching from muscle size to one rep max, essentially we're looking at improvement in strength. It was a relatively similar uh, bell curve style distribution, although you did obviously have a few um, anomalies. So that is kind of crazy. However, there is one big thing you have to take into consideration. This study didn't really control that much for nutrition. And that could be a really big factor because if you give people the same training program, but let's say some of them just naturally normally eat like 200 grams of protein because they're, they really like steak and chicken and, and tofu or whatever. But uh, some other people out there, they don't, they just don't like that protein. They eat like 20 grams of protein per day. You can train the same, but there is no way in hell that you are going to have a similar rate of muscle gain, a similar result. But you know what? Fine. You want some more science? Let's give you some more science. Study number two. This one took a sample size of 56 individuals. Not as much as the previous one, but 56 is still a pretty decent sized sample size. Um, uh, I think they were all relatively young, healthy uh, males. They had them do, again, a sim pretty much the exact same training program over the course of 12 weeks. However, the thing I like about this study is that their diet was controlled. They actually looked at the way they ate and they eliminated differences in nutritional intake as a potential source of error. Again, if you're eating like twice as much food and twice as much protein, there's a good chance that you're gonna put on, again, a lot more muscle mass. Then what they did is they looked at the top and bottom 20%. So the, the top 20% of people who had the biggest change in lean body mass. For those of you guys that don't know, by the way, hashtag physics lesson. That delta sign right there, that means change. So we're looking at the change in lean body mass. So they pretty much took the top and bottom 20% of responders, the middle 60%, they just tossed them out. We're not really interested in looking at that. Then this is gonna be kind of cool. They took biopsies of their, it was their uh, vastus lateralis, which is pretty much your quads, specifically your outer quad sweep. For those of you guys that don't know, biopsies are literally like the they, they pretty much go in and take a tiny little piece out and they, they you can you know, run various tests on it and like stick it under a microscope. And one of the things they looked at was changes in levels of microRNA. Now, for those of you guys that don't know, because why would you? Uh, microRNA is pretty much just a, how do I say this? It's a molecule similar to DNA, which is involved in things like gene expression, gene regulation, which can regulate what, what you, what, what makes you, you. And this is where things got interesting because when they looked at the top and bottom 20%, the high responders and the low responders to the actual training program, they found 21 different microRNAs, 17 of which pretty much show no change. They're, they're insignificant when it comes to this study. Four of them, they did show change and it showed change that directly affected the results of this study. For example, one of them, I think it was micro, micro RNA, it was like a, a number 378. This one did show a pattern where it was upregulated. There was more of it uh, in individuals who were high responders. This is pretty much saying that if you have more of this thing, which again, the top 20% did have more of this, it's gonna trigger gene expression, which led to increased muscle mass accumulation, increased strength, increased overall. It's this, this is good. This is a big deal because this means that, you know, apart from training nutrition, everything else was controlled in this study, but changes on a microscopic level of these factors in your body led to relatively drastic differences in your ability to put on muscle and strength. That's kind of a big deal. So now that we've established, unfortunately, some individuals out there are gonna have pretty significant differences when it comes to their actual ability to put on muscle mass, just raw pounds of muscle mass onto their bodies despite training the exact same way, eating the exact same way. That is what is essentially we are looking at when it comes to the first variable. That is what F stands for because guys, we need some kind of system of being able to look at this. We need some kind of nice, simple number to put in here and that is what we're gonna get. Everybody's favorites, we're going back to the FFMI score. If you guys haven't seen my previous videos, my extremely popular, I think like, like a million views each, uh, my video series on the whole natural debate as to whether or not individuals can potentially be natural or not, um, we use the FFMI, the fat-free uh, mass index, as a way of determining this. Now, we're not gonna be talking about that in this video because it gets way too controversial, and I'll be honest, it is subjective. This topic does need a little bit more science, but this score, nonetheless, I think is a fantastic way to establish your ability to put on muscle mass, whether it's good, average, or unfortunately not that great. Now, one thing I wanna say before we jump into this is that if you wanna look at my model, if you wanna look at FFMI, I really advocate that you do this after you actually have a few years of experience when it comes to proper nutrition, when it comes to proper training. You've actually given it, you, you've given it a shot because if you start plugging yourself into these variables, these formulas, these calculations, and you've only been training for six months, you're obviously not gonna have 
a body that you may have in one, two, three years. Once you've actually given it some time, you've given it some effort, and you may get a score which is lower than you will in a few years. Because this essentially is looking at your genetic potential. So the longer you've been training, the more and more accurate this number is gonna be. If you've been doing this for 10 years, the number is gonna make a lot more sense than if you try to do this when you've been training for six months. So if you guys are out there and you're still new to this, this is definitely a cool way to look at it, and this is something which you just, you know, just watch for fun and take into consideration, but take it with a grain of salt. You can't really apply this to yourself yet. Okay, so our first example calculation, we've got Steve Reeves. Now, I wanted someone who has probably like one of the best bodies you can get in terms of genetic and is pretty much 99% uh, natural, which is why I chose Steve Reeves. For those of you guys that don't know, fantastic uh, old school uh, bodybuilder back, I think it was in the 40s and 50s, also he was a big actor. And the reason I chose him is because he pretty much was popular at a time when steroids were so brand new. They weren't non-existent, they were invented like, I think they were used in like the 30s and 40s is when they really first came around. But at the time, in the 40s and 50s, it was still so brand new. I can pretty much say 99% chance Steve Reeves did not have any access to performance enhancing drugs such as anabolic steroids. So we were dealing with someone, weight 213 pounds. Again, these stats, I mean, it's hard to tell because this guy, he unfortunately passed away like 30 years ago and like his bodybuilding days was like 60 or 70 years ago, but 213 pounds, a reported height of six foot one, body fat percentage, bodybuilders back then didn't really get that shredded, that's more of a new thing. So back then you could literally win Mr. Universe and you could be not even like single digit body fat percentage. He was lean, don't get me wrong, I'd say let's just give an estimate 10% um, body fat. If you plug this into the FFMI formula, this comes out to about 25.8, which is stupendous, especially for a natural guy. This is pretty much, I would say, like you can potentially go higher than this naturally, but like that's when we're getting into like literally the top 0.0001%, like the genetic elite of the genetic elite. So this is pretty damn crazy. This is why him being essentially anything over 25, like you are incredible. If you did this naturally, holy crap. That is why he gets a perfect score of 30 out of 30 when it comes to the F score for our individual Steve Reeves. Now, let's take a, you know, let's take a look at someone else because, you know, good for him, but how about someone a little bit more normal? How about someone who actually relates to you guys, you know, the majority of my viewers? Person X. Let's give him a weight, 173 pounds, height of, you know, six feet tall, body fat percentage of 8%. Someone who is relatively lean. Someone who, for example, this is them probably, you know, like a men's physique competition or a bodybuilding competition or someone. Someone who gets, you know, they have to diet down for this. This is a legit competition prep. This isn't just beach lean. And then a fat-free mass index, this comes out to about 22. And in my opinion, according to my system, again, subjective, but based on my research, my 10, 12 plus years of experience in the fitness industry, this will give you a score of 15 out of 30. The reason I chose 15 is because it's exactly half, and I do think that if you've been training and eating and you've built you know, your body up over the course of a few years, again, this is not for beginners, this is about halfway there. If you're at 22, not bad. You have built a good physique, you definitely look like you lift, you know, you aren't genetically gifted, I would say, but you're not, you're also fortunate enough not to be genetically limited, to put it nicely. So this is 15 out of 30, and if you're wondering who that is, that's me. This, these are actually my stats for my competition um, I did a show back on September 30th of this year, my 2017 Ascension series. I'm gonna throw up you know, some photos on screen right now. This is me, this is pretty much the best physique that I've ever looked in terms of my stats. I'm damn proud of that. And this is, at least at this point in time, this is the best physique that I could potentially build with my genetic capability. Can I get better over the next few years? Of course, I can improve, I can get leaner, I can get a little bit bigger, but I'll be honest, I don't think I'm ever gonna get to that. And that does that suck? Yeah, but it's also good that I understand this because now I'm not gonna sit here, look at pictures of him and be like, why don't I look like that? I can't, you don't like it? Go complain to God or mother nature or go back in time, build a time machine and tell your mom to get a new dad. Okay guys, that is the video. Thank you so much for watching. Next time, tune in. We're gonna talk about the other variables. We're gonna put this all together and we are gonna get the finalized, the perfect, Vitruvian model of genetics. And I know what you guys are thinking, oh my God, this video is so informative, so amazing, and it's just one quarter of what you're gonna get? Damn right! I know, I know what you're thinking, oh my God, Igor, you're incredible. But there is, there is one way that, you know, you, if you wanna thank me, I mean, you know, you don't have to. It's not like, it's not like you have to do anything.